good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us at the end of what's shaped up to be a very exciting Ignite. I don't know about you guys, I've worked at Microsoft for over 30 years and I can't remember a show where the momentum coming out of it has just been so fantastic. So I appreciate everybody coming on the last day of the show. Ram, uh, Ravi Kalyan and I are thrilled to be here today to talk to you about the Oracle offerings that are available in Azure. Dive into the new Oracle database at Azure offering that we just announced and tell you how to get started with all of our customers. In the next 45 minutes or so, we're gonna talk about our options to migrate or mod <coughs> modernize Oracle applications to Azure using the solutions that customers have really been asking for. We're gonna drill into the new Oracle database at Azure offering that we announced in September and tell you the details on that. And then as I said, we'll tell you how to get started with your customers in the field. You know, this is the big topic around Oracle database solutions. Why cloud, why Azure, and why now? And it really starts by listening to our customers. <clears throat> you know, according to recent surveys, in today's world, things are just continuing to change. And if you talk to the leaders of IT organizations around the world, they're really depending on the cloud to help them modernize and migrate their applications. 65% of them revealed that they have a strategy to use cloud to address some of the challenges that they're facing today. Things like security threats, inflation, lack of developers. They need to use the cloud and the agility that it offers. 75% of them are building new solutions in the cloud and they're depending upon the cloud to help keep them ahead of this rapidly changing environment. And AI is no longer a distant opportunity for customers. 82% of the leaders believe that working with AI today is gonna to improve the productivity of their applications, their workforce, and raise the satisfaction in their environment. So they just simply can't sit still. Additionally, today, customers trust Microsoft with their Oracle workloads. You know, thousands of organizations, small, medium, and large, are already bringing their Oracle workloads to Azure, whether it's an SAP customer who's not ready to move to HANA, telco customers using Amdocs on top of Oracle, customers building native solutions using Azure Native or Azure VMware solutions. People are successfully running their solutions on Azure today, and they trust Azure to deliver their Oracle workloads. We've been listening to our customers, as I said earlier, and we really are offering what I believe is the rich, richest set of options for customers looking to migrate or modernize their Oracle applications in the cloud today. We provide tools and services that enable customers to migrate mission-critical workloads, bring their databases to Azure Native, and now Oracle Native infrastructure in Azure databases, or in Azure data centers. We have a broad uh, uh, inventory of ISV solutions like Silk, Tessel, and Lightbits that help customers optimize their solutions. And we've got a host of modernization opportunities allowing our customers to take advantage of our investments in Azure Fabric, our investments in Power BI, and the full suite of AI services that we have for customers. So, you know, in our humble view, there really is no better place to build your Oracle application in the public cloud today than in Azure. And I would say we've been working with our partners at Oracle for more than five years, bringing a variety of solutions to Azure, and that's been helping customers continue this migration trend. Customers who are using Oracle and IS, they get a fully native Azure experience. They have the ability to migrate their mission-critical database applications, optimize their cost in TCO. It's available in all of our regions, just like you would expect any Azure service to be, and customers get full support from Microsoft and Oracle on the supported configuration. You know, we've already seen great success with customers like ABN AMRO, a Dutch financial services company who's modernized and realized great TCO, or customers like an Egyptian builder, uh, Alexandria Construction. They really saw the benefits of doing this and they were early adopters to our cloud. So if all of you want more information on that, we've got some great use cases on azure.com for you to go learn about. These customers, we have a range of database uh, VMs available to them so they can control their performance and cost. Customers can choose from a broad range of storage options to meet their applications and I, their IOPS and throughput needs. You know, everything from premium SSD all the way up to Azure NetApp files and everything in between. 
In addition to our native offerings, we have an expanding set of partner solutions that can help customers achieve millions of IOPS using uh, Azure VMs or other native storage options. Solutions like Lightbits, Tessels, NVMe, and Silk are really helping customers bring their applications to Azure and maintain consistent performance with what they're seeing on premise. So all of these solutions are available for customers in the marketplace today. You know, and so if you're a customer who's looking to bring a single instance database to the public cloud, we have everything you need to get started in Azure today. And as I said, we've seen a lot of customers successfully doing it. In addition to that offering, I'd like to talk about our most recent announcement, the Oracle database offering at Azure. You know, it's really astounding to me that it took 30 years to get Larry to Redmond, but the fact that he came for this, it really speaks volumes about the important importance of this offering to both Microsoft and Oracle. And it, related to this offering, I am thrilled to announce today that we will have our first capacity available in December in our East US data center, and customers will be able to get started before Christmas. Huge round of applause to the teams at Microsoft and Oracle who've been working round the clock to make sure we delivered it before the end of the year ahead of the announce. Thank you. In addition to our capacity in East US, Colleen, I'm gonna talk a little more about the other preview regions, but we'll have more regions that we'll announce very early next calendar year, and so tune back in December for the updated capacity roadmap. Now, what is this offer? So what are we talking about? Well, with Oracle Database at Azure, customers get the highest level of Oracle Database performance, scale, and availability. They get feature parity with Oracle services in OCI. They get a fully integrated experience within Azure that is consistent with the rest of their Azure applications. And they get a collaborative support model, so they get the best support from Microsoft and Oracle as needed. How does it work? Customers can go purchase the offering in the Azure Marketplace, deploy and manage it and monitor it through our portal or using our APIs, and they can combine it with the full suite of Azure services to build end-to-end -end applications with low latency in the public cloud. It's really amazing. The other thing about this is, is we really are bringing customers the best of both Microsoft and Oracle across the stack. Customers get trusted data management, high scale with high performance from Oracle using capabilities like real-time application clusters, the, uh, autonomous database when it comes, the performance of Exadata, and they get all the trusted application services from Microsoft, our VMs, our container services, and all of the Azure Fabric and OpenAI services that have been the buzz. You know, so they get the best available to them from both companies. But in addition to the capabilities, they also get the best from Microsoft and Oracle from an operation perspective. They have best-in-class application operations coming from Microsoft around the application stack, everything from managing the infrastructure, keeping it up to date, and keeping it healthy. And then they have the best-in-class operations management for their database infrastructure provided by Oracle. The experts at Oracle will manage the Exadata lifecycle, maintain the health, and manage the health of the VM cluster, and maintain the database system. So, Really, customers who are using services from both companies today on premise are assured that they get the same support and the same expertise when they're running these solutions in the cloud. And we wanted to make sure that there were no adoption blockers for customers in buying this multi-party offering. And so we made sure that customers can take advantage of their Azure commit to consume and burn down on their Mac commitment for Microsoft for their uh, Oracle database at Azure solution. They can take care of their Oracle investments, bring their own licenses, or keep consistent terms that exist in their ULAs today. They can get support rewards for this offering so they continue to burn down the cost of their support agreement with Oracle, which is very essential to many customers. And so we work very hard to make sure that there are no adoption blockers and that there's no friction amongst the fields to go deliver the offering and customers get a consistent message, whether they're talking to an Oracle field rep, a Microsoft field rep, or both. And that's really resonating well with customers. So that's a little bit of an overview of the solutions that we have in Azure and the Oracle uh, database at Azure offering. Now, I'd like to invite uh, Ravi Terlapati, the head of strategic products and growth at OCI, up to talk about why customers love Exa and why our latest offering really addresses their needs. Thank you all, and have a great rest of Ignite. There you go, Ravi.
Thank you, Brett. Okay. Um, numbers don't lie. I think this number tells many a story. For the last 20, 30 years, customers have built their mission critical enterprise applications on the Oracle database. And if you look at um, if you look at this particular graph, it'll, it'll show you the penetrations across every industry vertical. And the key word there is mission critical applications. When you think about database options, for, I mean, technology has evolved over the last 30 years in, 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 in astounding ways that we can invent that we may not be able to imagine. Cloud has really taken center stage in the last 10 years. Today, it's not a question of if, it's just a question of when you migrate your workloads to the cloud. And what customers are realizing is, it's important to focus on your business practices, it's important to innovate in your business areas, and not really worry about the undifferentiated heavy lifting of the tech stack. Well, that's a cloud message, but then the world that we live in today, there's a lot of options. And with options comes complexity because you have decisions and choices to make. And our effort here is to really simplify the journey from an Oracle point of view for you, depending on wherever you are in your cloud migration. As I go deeper into this presentation today, I want to touch upon first, what is it that makes the Oracle database um, one of the best databases out there for your mission critical applications? If you asked 20 years ago, where do you want to build your mission critical applications on-prem? The answer was the Oracle database, and that's how we built the Exa and the RAC technologies. So RAC, this technology was introduced way back in 2001. It was, in a way, before cloud. And what RAC allowed customers to do is really um, you were able to scale your application across the database horizontally. Now, that concept is probably commonplace today, and you can achieve it by yourself if you are designing it yourself. The point is um, this, this technology existed 20, 30 years ago, and that's what powered your applications, right? And building on top of, and the other thing um, RAC also achieves is high availability right within the database. So you have... Um, you're able to run multiple nodes, and as a result, you're able to switch the application from active to active with the database just being there right underneath the hood. And so that's another reason why um, it's the backbone for mission-critical applications. The third concept is we bake in all the cloud concepts of containerization right into the database. So in the database, we have this concept of containers. We have the concept of pluggable databases. What that allows you to achieve is you're able to really shift um, your application processing depending on um, which nodes run into issues. And of course, it achieves horizontal and vertical scaling. That's about Rack, the, the, the innovation that's been there for about 20 years. And on our journey, it's not just the software um, innovations that we did uh, from a database point of view, it's also the hardware innovations. Um, a good analogy is the iPhone. If you think about the iPhone, I think the thing that Apple brings unique to customers is this the synergy between software and the hardware stack, wherein the product just works. You don't really question if the Apple iPhone works. And in the enterprise world, Oracle database technologies with Rack and Exa are synonymous with that, where they just work. You don't have to worry about are you losing data, you don't have to worry about um, uh, you know, downtime, so on and so forth, um, because there's a lot of good technology that's baked in. So if you just look at across the analytics, OLTP space, even availability, we achieve five nines, let that sink in, five nines of availability. And this is certified by um, IDC and, and, and the world out there, right? So that's not easy to achieve, and these are public stats. And if you think about the future, and you said, okay, well, Ravi, this is all well and good. You're talking about on-prem technologies. How does this map into the cloud? The short answer is these technologies are available in the cloud. Uh, it's Oracle Cloud Infrastructure. And our future with, um, as we innovate in the cloud is the autonomous database. So let me talk about how the autonomous database is vastly different than any other database offering in the cloud. We'll talk about how you can use it in an Azure context. So if you look at any of the hyperscalers and you look at the number of databases out there, you know, you have a database for graph, you have a database for NoSQL, you probably use uh, Amazon DynamoDB, um, uh, you get the idea. Depending on your data stores, there's different databases. These document, JSON, NoSQL, SQL, Graph. There's about 20 different database types. And you think about the complexity that it introduces into your DevOps stack, where you have a plethora of app options, and then you have a plethora of database options. And 
you look at any application uh, arch architecture diagram, you'd, you'd see at least 15 to 20 components in there. And that increases a lot of DevOps complexity. At Oracle, we have a very simple strategy. We have one database. It's the Oracle database. Doesn't matter what your data type is. It's JSON, it's document, it's graph, whatever the case might be, it's the same database. We call it a converged engine. On top of this converged engine, we, we, bake, we bake in Rack, we bake in Exa, the hardware optimizations that I talked about, and then we merge it with a converged engine, and then we have a fully managed application, fully managed service with the autonomous database. And we also bake in AI, we also bake in vector-driven databases, and all those concepts right in there. So as an example, we, we are in this age of AI, right? We talk about training and machine learning all the time. If you have to do this in AWS, you probably have your data in RDS. You have to move a sub subset of the data into Redshift for your ETL. Then you figure out what your training data set is, and you're training the data set in Amazon SageMaker. You train your model. Then you go deploy it for inference. Imagine the data pack, and imagine the hops, the, the technical proficiency you need to have, and the DevOps complexity it introduces. At Oracle, we bake it in the same place. We don't move the data. The AI is built into the database. And in this world where you have a plethora of options with numerous companies giving you cloud solutions and data lakes, data meshes, data strategies, it's super important to not move the data. If you think it's easy to move data between companies, imagine moving data just inside of a company. It's not so easy if you're a big bank, you have an asset and wealth management division and you have a commercial bank. I don't think it's so straightforward to move, share the data just between those two divisions, let alone between two different companies. And you take it into healthcare, you take it into other markets, it becomes increasingly complex with data protection and privacy. So the simple answer, don't move the data. Um, okay, so we talked about how Oracle became center stage to be known for mission critical applications and databases. For the last 20, 30 years, we talked about what you can do in the cloud. The same database options are available in the cloud with Exadata service, um, with autonomous database service, right? So we have those services, but that's not all. Because when you think about database architectures, there's, there's a lot of stuff, ancillary products around the database. Um, in this world where you probably run some of your workloads on-prem, you probably have a private cloud, you probably use um, uh, public cloud technologies too. At any point in time, your applications are spread across three different data centers and three different types of clouds, right? Your on-prem, your pub private cloud, your, your public cloud. And so when we approach this problem, from an Oracle database point of view, our main mission is to say, how do we ensure your applications achieving the highest availability across the stack? So there's, there's a couple of, this is a lot to chew in. This probably is a five hour session if I'm doing a deep dive on MA architecture, so I won't go there. But the idea is very simple. Back in the day, when I first started my career, we'd say, hey, you know what, there's a database, take a backup, and then point your application to the backup, right? But imagine the world we're living in, the data is continuously flowing in. It's not enough to just take a backup and point to the backup because by the time you go to the backup, the data has moved. You've lost transactions. So the main mission is across what is your recovery point from where you're recovering your application and um, what is the time that it takes for you to recover? Because inevitably when you run into issues, either uh, the data center had an issue, maybe there's no power, maybe there's no internet, uh, there are some critical issues that cripple data centers, right? And they don't happen very often. They happen very rarely, but when it happens, it's a big event. When it happens, there's a lot of impact, and that impact runs into, you know, you not being able to run your mission-critical applications. So it's very important to have data security. It's very important to have, to not move the data, and very important to restore it in near real time. And that's why we have these MA best practices and they talk about how you can achieve that status. And we categorize it across four tiers. We have our bronze, silver, gold, and platinum. And you don't have to be in the platinum tier. It depends what your needs are. And we'll talk quickly about what that is. But um, we have a suite of products. There's Data Guard, there's Golden Gate, there's Active Data Guard, um, there's Zero Data Loss Recovery Service. All of these services are designed to move your data in near real time from on-prem to the cloud. They're designed so you can run two different databases in two different availability zones um, and do synchronous replication between them. The design so you offload the non-important processes to your standby database. 
So your primary database is running at full throughput and efficiency. And then the question is, okay, how do you go use them? Um, it's, it's about your needs and what you're willing to architect, right? So again, like I said, there's, there's four different um, tiers, um, bronze all the way through platinum. And this is not new. If you're an Oracle customer, you're familiar with this because we, we talk about this for on-prem. We talk about this for Oracle Cloud. Why am I talking about this here? The message is simple. These architectures work for the Oracle database at Azure. They just work. They work because what you're consuming in, Azure, in at Azure context, what Brett talked about, is you're consuming the OCI Oracle Cloud database services running natively in Azure. And because it's the same technology, the supporting suite of technologies that we have, they're just gonna work out of the box. Um, let's just take a simple example. I, I pick gold because we see 80% of, of the mission critical applications really fitting into the sweet spot. Um, and here, basically what you're seeing is you, you have a single Azure region and there's two availability zones. And we've deployed the database in both availability zones. And you're using Active Data Guard to do synchronous application between them. What that means is the, the, the database is running in your secondary AZ. It's constantly syncing up with your primary database um, at a transaction level. And with Active Data Guard, it does a bunch more. Uh, it also offloads some of the read-only operations, if you will, to, to the secondary database. And so your primary is way more efficient and it gives you better TCO. And then you're also doing DR across a region because at the end of the day, if an entire region runs into an issue, um, you'd, you'd, you'd want a failover option. And we again have tooling um, uh, with tools such as Data Guard where you're able to we are able to leverage cross-region um, backups, cross-region things, and you're able to just switch over seamlessly from one region into another. So this is just one of the patterns. Um, silver is, uh, is a different shade of this. Platinum is a higher shade of this, where you're also running, where you're also running in two availability zones in, in the secondary region, right? So we build, on, we build on whatever architectures needed for you, and these blueprints are there. We're gonna be furnishing these blueprints in an Azure context. The simple message that I wanna leave you all um, with uh, today is this. Oracle databases have powered mission critical workloads. If you are exiting your data centers, um, the, the best place to do that is to just do a lift and shift into an OCI database. And you can use OCI databases in Azure, like Brett talked about, so there's optionality for you, and, and that's the part of simplification, if you will. And that's not just all. If you're trying to consume databases in Azure and you're modernizing your applications, we have technologies such as Autonomous Database, which is in our roadmap, it's gonna come through, that's gonna give you a whole range of benefits from um, DevOps simplicity as well as all the other things that I talked about. And so with that, um, let's also quickly look at migration methods. Um, we're gonna publish this, of course, after the session, you can look it through. The point is there's about 30 different products Oracle products and technologies that run through very fine-grained use cases that you have from a data migration, data mesh, data strategy point of view. And we have all sorts of migration, be it logical, be it physical, where we literally take your database and physically move it into a data center in the cloud. We support all of them. And so it really comes down to uh, your choice, but our recommended choice is zero downtime migration. And I let the word sink in, zero we are guaranteeing there is no downtime. We're not, talk, we're not talking about a scenario where there will be downtime. We're telling you there is no downtime. So I'll, I'll let that speak for itself. And here's an app pattern. Here's an architecture pattern. You basically use um, ZDM with Data Guard. Both products are you know, part of the package. And as you use it, that is the easiest way for you to move the data. And um, if you're interested, we can talk about it more. Enough slides, I think. Um, we, want, we also want to show you something. With that, I'll hand it over to Kalyan, who's going to talk, show you a demo of, of the product. Kalyan, off to you. Can you hear me? Thank you, Ravi. It was fantastic. So the leading principle there, like Ravi was talking about, is it should just work, right? So. Give me a sec, I'll log in here. 
hope it just works. It does. Okay. So yeah, the leading principle there was it should just work. Uh, not just the database, but everything should just work. We wanted to ensure there is very low learning curve for across all uh, all personas in your company, right? So we'll kind of go over a few personas. We'll kind of see how uh, we are ensuring this just works, right? Um, let me go back. Wow. Okay. So, oops. Sec. Let me bring it up again. Yes. Obviously, demos, if they go well without any hiccups, it's a problem. We all know that, right? So to start with, right, we, uh, we talked about how it is all about different personas. Uh, the first persona. Yes, obviously, IT admin, DBA, all of them are there. But you also have your uh, uh, persona, procurement persona within the company, right? So the procurement persona uh, in any enterprise who, is, uh, who has both Oracle and Azure at this point in time probably know how to work best with their Oracle reps, work best with their Microsoft reps. In this case, like we said, we wanted, wanted it to just work. So. Your Oracle database, I mean, your Oracle Exadata infrastructure, we're not going to make it complicated for you. You can go on your, I mean, for your company or for on behalf of your customer, you can go talk to the sales rep of the customer. You probably have pre-negotiated a number of things with them. All of them that are pre-negotiated for Oracle XSCS are applicable here. So they should be able to go extend uh, the same contract for you here and they should be able to work with you to create, uh, uh, to go sign the contract, just like you would do if it is an, if it is an Oracle Cloud uh, region. And once that paperwork is done, they'll come in and they'll give you a, um, what we call as a private offer, right? So if you have, and, and again, this is, the persona of a procurement guy who knows how to deal with their Oracle, uh, Oracle rep and is now coming to Azure to go complete the process within Azure. So the contract negotiation is done. The Oracle rep has uploaded the offer in your Azure marketplace, which is pretty standard. So you, you would go in here, you would go purchase, I mean the procurement persona will go purchase, what is super important and interesting here is if you see, the offer is Azure, in, uh, Azure benefit eligible, which means uh, if you have an existing Mac commitment, this offer will be eligible for existing Mac commitment, or if you need to go extend a Mac, you could always do that, right? So they will go in here, they'll go review the offer. It should be the same terms as you have in the offer that you have negotiated with Oracle. Come back, validate all this information, Go click on purchase, and that should uh, let you come to this page where you could go fill in your subscription information, validate all of this, and uh, simply go ahead to go create. What does it do? It goes and creates your SaaS subscription, which is what tells us that this customer has now purchased an Oracle database at Azure subscription and is able to go and is LO listed to go provision this service in Azure portal. Like we said, we wanted this to be something that just works and is at parity with your experience in Azure. So once the purchasing experience is done, then you switch your persona to an actual IT admin. And in this case, the IT admin is going and provisioning the Exadata infrastructure. So they can come to their familiar Azure experience, they can go look for database services, Oracle pops up there, you can go uh, go look up, and uh, obviously the standard things, you go select your subscription, you go, obviously you have to name it, you go, uh, uh, you go name your Exadata uh, infrastructure. Uh, like you can see, 
It is the same Exadata 9M instances that you have in Oracle Cloud, and as new ones roll in, we'll also start bringing them in. You can configure your storage and uh, database servers. You can come in, you can go configure your maintenance. Uh, obviously, that's not exactly same as what you would have within your OCI cloud. Uh, most important, yes, you have to agree. You, you have to consent to this. Uh, and then, once you click on Create, it goes and uh, goes and provisions the Oracle Exadata infrastructure. So far, what, he, what it has done is basically provisioned your Exadata machines. And once, uh, once it is provisioned, you can go look up all of the information, make sure it is all same as what you wanted, and. Uh, if you wanted to add tags in consistent with all of your Azure uh, app experience, you can go add your tags. And uh, once that is done, your Exadata infrastructure is all provisioned. So what happens after that? Then it's your VM provisioning, right? The Exadata VM cluster provisioning. Come to your, once your infrastructure is provisioned, you come here, you go give it your name. In this case, we are naming it the demo. You select the region. Right now, like uh, Brett mentioned, we are only going to go make it happen. And, uh, I mean, the first region will be East US, uh, coming soon in December. So you go select the region. You go select the Exadata infrastructure that is provisioned. Uh, as you can see, you can either do license included, or go, uh, or you can go uh, purchase new licenses. You can select whatever option. Uh, you select the uh, infrastructure version. You select uh, the public key of your choice. You can uh, you can either create a new key or use an existing key. Uh, provide that key information, and once you go create, it'll let you let you do what you typically do in your OCI cloud, which is basically to configure your VM resources. You can scale up, scale down, whatever uh, whatever you need for your app uh, at the provisioning time, and also eventually. Uh, you can select your uh, snapshot types, backup type. You can say what your usable storage allocation is. Very, very consistent with how you would have done in OCI. Uh, then uh, skip through fast uh, because networking is super fast. You have the option to go provision this in your VNet, just like you are able to provision everything else. You go select your sub, uh, you go select your VNet, you go select your subnet, and you go uh, go validate all the information as complete. And once you click create, it will go provision your VM cluster. So far, it is the IT admin persona that, uh, like we have been telling you, what we wanted was it just had to work. There, is, there has to be super, super low learning curve for someone who knows Oracle, someone who knows Azure. We wanted to bring it together. And hence, all the same configurations you are able to do with Oracle, you can do here, right? And you are able to go create your Exadata infrastructure. You are able to create your VM infrastructure. And once that is done, then is when comes your third persona, which is the database administrator persona. Uh, we're not showing it here, but uh, it is consistent with what you have today. You can go uh, go work on your database just like you're able. To, uh, you're working with a data, an Oracle database that is uh, in Oracle today, right? So now that the provisioning experience is complete, let's actually put it together in the app format, right? So. This is a canonical app, very, very popular pattern that we see. Modern app, container-based. Uh, so like you can see, you, uh, all the front end, exactly same as what you would do in uh, what you would do in Azure, the same landing zone that you would have for a canonical app. Then you have your, uh, no, then you have a choice of the databases that you want to provision. In the previous ones, we provision the Exadata infrastructure, we provision the Exadata VMs, and then databases, and they are going to be available here, right? So for in the context of an Azure app admin, let's see, in this context, um, I have provisioned my node pools already. I want to go play around with my node pools because I, I think uh, I'm going to have a good increase in usage. I'll go, uh, go check on one of my node pools. I need to increase the scale my node pool out. And once I scale it out, what you see here is some of this work that we have been doing a uh, result of some of this work that we have been doing closely with Oracle team. If you're noticing, what you're seeing here is your Exadata infrastructure and also your app 
all pumping telemetry through Azure Monitor directly into one screen. This is the custom dashboard that, is, that, uh, that enables all Azure admins to go look at all of their app state in one place. Happy to say, by my, at launch, you will see all of this coming together. You don't have to go to multiple consoles to look at all of your app infrastructure and the DB infrastructure to go monitor this. All of this is available in one place in Azure Dashboard. Uh, we do all the hard work for you so that you don't have to worry about uh, switching screens and things like that. Um, and we hope that is pretty powerful. We'll continue to take feedback and uh, see how the experience can be improved. So that is, uh, that, that basically is how we are making it uh, super simple, super straightforward, low learning curve for any persona you have, right? Uh, before I go to my last demo, I uh, wanted to maybe ask a quick alphabet quiz. Uh, what comes after O? Do you know? Okay, how about this? What comes after A? No, I. We changed the alphabets in this conference. After A, it is I. <laughs> so, so let's, obviously, without, without an AI demo, the conference is not complete. Last day, we had to show an AI demo. So that this is, uh, and uh, you, you can tell I'm a foodie. I love uh, sweet stuff. So this is an example of a co-pilot that is built on GPT-4 uh, for the demo purpose. Hope my friends over at DoorDash and other uh, popular food companies are watching this and are able to build something like this. In this, uh, what we basically uh, did was to go, if, it's, if you're seeing, this is your Azure, uh, Azure native uh, prompt, uh, prompt flow. Uh, if you're seeing where my mouse is pointing right now, uh, the source for this is coming off an Oracle database, uh, which means now Promflow understands your Oracle uh, understands Oracle as a source, is able to go bring in the data from Oracle, and is able to go give you that whole co-pilot experience uh, right like any other database, any other Azure database, right? In this particular example, what we are doing is, uh, like we said, uh, I will ask my favorite question, which is, uh, do you have anything sweet? What happens now is, like you can see, there are a few things that are happening in this co-pilot. Uh, the uh, inputs, it kind of understands my question because, of, uh, because we have trained it uh, and configured the prompt flow. It knows what the output should be. It knows how uh, this question will have to be interpreted. And most importantly, as you can see here, it is able to go connect to Oracle, retrieve my previous orders, retrieve my uh, retrieve the customer information, able to put all of it together, understand what the menu options are, uh, understand what products are available in this particular uh, company, uh, understand the customer, like we said, and based on the previous orders for the customer, is able to go figure out the next best option because you have, because this particular customer has tried something similar, uh, we are able to suggest that uh, peanut butter cups is maybe a good option for you, right? I hope my, my friends over at DoorDash and other places are watching, and next time I go in there to go use a co-pilot, I can simply go in and ask for something that I want and not have to go search 100 different uh, restaurants to go find what I want, right? And that, is a quick outlook of what you could do with the power of Oracle and uh, uh, Azure coming together in ways that we have not been able to do before. With that, uh, let's actually go back, wrap it up. Ravi, if you can come on stage. Let's, let's actually go bring it all together. Do you have the clicker? There you go. Yep. So let's put everything into context here, right? So like Ravi said, you should be able to do all HAA, MAA architectures uh, in Azure. This is really best of uh, both worlds, the goodness of Azure, which is like we saw, the portal, same Azure portal, same DevOps experience, in your same VNet, proximity from, uh, proximity because it is in the same data center, zonal support, in all the primary regions you are going into, and deep integration with all services, in, including the AI services, right? 
And from Oracle? Um, yeah, just to, just to summarize again, um, what you're really using is the same OCI uh, database services in an Azure context, which means it's the same uh, Oracle tooling. You don't have to worry about um, uh, feature parity uh, from, from a zero data loss recovery point of view or any of the other things that, that we've talked about. And so um, the message is simple. You're able to use, you're able to bring your mission critical systems running on Oracle databases in an Azure context. Cool. Okay. So with that, let's look at what's next. Uh, so this is your Azure Migrate and modern, uh, modern Experience. This is like one-stop shop for uh, all of, uh, when you go here, you should be able to see all of the comprehensive resources in one place. You'll see extensive coverage for uh, everything you would like to see. Uh, there are a ton of session resources here. Uh, finally, this is where you can go. Uh, either on the Oracle side or on the Azure side, and you should be able to go find all the resources uh, for this. Team is doing a lot of work, like Ravi said, we are doing a lot of work in ensuring. Uh, we have updated content for landing zones, we have updated reference architectures, we have updated uh, experience videos and everything you would need. Uh, it'll be available very soon when we go make that final announcement on uh, GA being available, we'll make sure all the content is published. Uh, in the meantime, you can absolutely work with uh, your Azure team or the Oracle team to understand what is in uh, what is being built. If you want us to go uh, design the landing zone with you for your application, happy to extend uh, uh, extend our support in ensuring uh, you are able to do what is right for your application and uh, go through the purchasing experience to go try things out when we have it out in. Uh, uh, December in U.S. East. Cool. Super. I, right. I suppose we have two minutes. So if anybody has questions, maybe we can take one, one or two questions. No questions. Not one. It was perfectly clear to everybody. <laughs> that was the hope. Yeah. That it has to just work. Huh? Oh, super. Okay, so the question is, uh, how do licenses work? Can you, um, how, what is the purchase experiences? And can you use your existing Oracle licenses? The short answer is yes. Um, basically, we have two simple SKUs. We have bring your own license and license included. License included is where you're buying a new license. Bring your own licenses, you're getting your existing licenses. So it's the exact same SKUs, even at Azure. And um, you just pick the SKU that's relevant to you. You contract with Oracle from the point of view of the contract negotiation, the pricing and terms is with your Oracle sales rep. And then the mechanism is uh, we put a private offer to your Azure Marketplace and you transact with Azure Marketplace, right? So the, the, the deal negotiations with Oracle from the database point of view, you can use, it's, it's exactly the same, the SKUs are the same. And then um, the mechanism for the transaction is with Marketplace. Yeah? Okay. Yeah, uh, my question goes uh, almost on the same line, but um, now related to OCI, because if I'm already in OCI, yes. um, all the licenses that I have there to, to use, if we can, let's say, use this in, in, on Azure, for example, these credits that we already have on OCI, if we can use on Azure. Oh, you mean the, the Oracle Cloud UCM credits? Yeah. yeah, because we are already in OCI, for yes, example. Yeah. So we want also to use Oracle infrastructure on Azure because we have all of sure. our application on Azure also. So yeah. um, if it's possible uh, to use these credits from Oracle in OCI, from OCI uh, on Azure. The, um, so the, the, the simple answer to that is basically UCM and Mac are similar programs from two different companies. And we are not merging both of those, right? So they're very different programs. So if you have a commitment in UCM for Oracle Cloud, that's a separate commitment to what you're doing with Azure, right? And so that wouldn't work. But the, in terms of uh, the SKU list and the public price list that we have for database, um, for all of the OCI databases that we have, and what we extend in Azure, that pricing, the, the SKU list and the pricing, public price list is exactly the same, okay. right? So. Because the, the also, also to add on, you're getting the benefit from Azure uh, for Mac retirements, which is why it doesn't make sense for us to also bundle in UCM, right? Okay. Great, last question please, if any. Yeah. 
All right. Yes. Thanks, everybody, Thank for coming. All. Happy Thank Thanksgiving. You. Cheers. Yep.